And like I like to say, Shabbat Shalom. The Torah portion today. What is the name of the Torah portion? Okay, okay. Korach. We are like Bach and Beethoven Bach. It's actually Korach. Uh, and that it is. Here's the Kuf, the K, the Resh, and the Chet. I'm going to try to slowly introduce you to all of these things so you can see what happened. And look at this. What happened to Korah? Hey, the earth, you know, one of the amazing things about this story, it talks about like this giant earthquake opened up and swallowed him, but then it closed his mouth. How often in an earthquake do you see it open and then close? I mean, this is a, and what happened to him and his, oh, here he goes. I got to put him down. Ah, he's going down. What happened to his whole family? None of them went with him. His entire family was saved. His wife and kids wanted nothing to do with them, and they left, and only he went down. And you want to know the proof of that? A lot of the Psalms were written by the sons of Korah. It tells you, written by the sons of Korah. Now, what was Korah's big thing? What did he want to become? A priest. Now, was Korah a Levite? He, he was a Levite. But why wasn't he a priest? He was an Aaron's son. Only, so 99% of the Levites were not priests. Just the sons of Korah. Oh, I'm kidding. Uh, actually, just the sons of Aaron. But... Even though Korah wanted to be a priest, he never could because he wasn't of the line of Aaron. Did any of his sons ever become a priest? Samuel. Samuel was a son of Korah. He was a descendant of Korah. Isn't that amazing? And here Samuel is the one who was defending the God of Israel like crazy. So this week, <clears throat> what we have is the rebellion of Korah with all of his murmurings. Do you realize he was rebellious? He was a murmurer. And look how it affected everybody else around him. That's why we have to be so careful about listening to people who are gossipers or power hungry. <clears throat> so what's amazing to me also was right after this, <clears throat> uh, First, we, ha we had the sin of the spies, right? And now they all have to be in the wilderness and die. And then that's when Korah rebels. I mean, you'd think the spies would have learned from the murmuring, murmurings of Miriam. And you think Korah would have learned from the deal with the spies. But for some reason, mankind, we, some of us just never learned. I had a, a, I can't remember, I think I heard this thing. I'd rather learn from other people's mistakes so I don't have to make them all myself. So <laughs> you know, it's good to learn what's wrong as well as what's right. So let's start with number 16, one through three. It says, now Korach, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi. Do you know what Korah means? What does his name mean, Korach? It means this right here. Bald. That's what it means, bald. So I, I bet you he was bald. I know he was as a baby probably, who knows. Okay, what did he do? We see there was two other guys, Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab. They were probably brothers. Okay. What do we remember about Dathan and Abiram? Does anyone remember? Dathan and Abiram. I will show you here in just a minute. Okay, it says On also. On is the son of Peleth, the sons of Reuben. And what did they do? They took men. In, in one sense, they took their hearts. They turned all of them toward their rebellious attitude. Why do you think the sons of Reuben would want to join Korah? Okay. Reuben was the firstborn who lost firstborn privileges. 
and they felt like as the firstborn, they should be in charge. Well, Korah was the firstborn of, in his particular family. And so you get people, sometimes we can get led astray if we maintain hurts. We really can. What did they do? They rose up, all of them, before Moses with certain of the children of Israel. And look who the certain were. 250 princes. Not only that, they were famous. They were men of renown. And so if you're, you know, just a little peon member of the children of Israel, and here comes 250 leaders who are famous. They're men of renown. And they're all coming together to come against Moses and Aaron. They gathered themselves together against Moses and Aaron. And look at what they said. You take too much upon you. In other words, you're taking too much upon yourself. Seeing all the congregation are holy, every single one of them. Remember, God called Israel a holy nation. They were all holy. But guess what? God is holy, holy, holy. Okay? Moses and Aaron were holy, holy. <laughs> they were just holy. <clears throat> and they say, the Lord is among them. Wherefore, then, he says, why do you lift up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord? Well, now, wait a minute. They didn't lift themselves up. As a matter of fact, if I recall, Moses wanted nothing to do with it, and he was trying to fight it. So here you see in this whole Torah portion the difference between power-hungry people and humble people. This is the, it's a famous battle that you're going to see in the days ahead. See, this is prophetic. Things that happen, happen again, and you're going to see that here in a little bit. <clears throat> what do you think his motivation was by saying this? When he says everyone is holy, think of communism. Covertly, what he was saying is, I should be the leader. But what happens, Reuben was thinking they should be the leader. They were the firstborn. So here you have Korah teaming up with all these other people who all want to be number one, but what happens, how many of you know, let's look at modern history. Islam is made up of two groups. What is it? The Sunni and the Shiites, okay? Together, they team up to defeat Israel, but after they do, they kill each other. All the time, you get all, think about this. Why in the world would the woke people team up with Islam? What does Islam want to do to all the gay activists? They want to kill them. And yet all the gay activists are teaming up with Islam. I, I mean, it's insane. Why? Because they all hate Israel. What you're about to see take place right here on earth is all these people who can't stand each other hate Israel more. But what's going to happen is like what happens every time in biblical stories, all the nations come divide Israel, and then they end up fighting each other and destroying each other. This is a pattern. This is what is that we're going to read about today is what is going to be happening today. Let's look at it. Numbers 14.35, I, the Lord, have said, I will surely do it unto all of this evil congregation that are gathered together against me in this wilderness. They will be consumed, and there they shall die. Here we have a congregation, a group of people that are evil, and here they claim to be against Moses and Aaron, but they're actually against God. Why are they against God? God's the one who appointed Moses and Aaron. They have to understand they didn't want to do, they didn't want this position. They just got stuck there because God said, I know you guys are humble. And so look what happens in verse 39 through 42. When Moses put the words before the children of Israel, the people were, this is last Torah portion here, Numbers 14. I'm going over, I'm just reminding you of what's coming in number 16. Here, Moses told them that they're all going to die in the wilderness for 40 years. 
And the people were full of grief. Early in the morning, they got up, they went to the top of the mountain and they said, looky, looky, we're here. We're going to go up to the place which the Lord has said he would give us for we have done wrong. And Moses says, why are you now acting against the Lord's order seeing no good will come of it? Don't go up for the Lord is it with you and you will be overcome by those who are fighting against you. Here, what was consistent? They were against the Lord both times. They were against the Lord because they didn't want to go up. And now they're going against the Lord because now they want to go up. And he says, don't go up. So we have to realize we have to do things in the right order at the right time. If you don't get on the boat before it rains, <laughs> it, you're in trouble. Now, how many of you have ever heard of the stages of grief? I think we've all heard about all the different stages of grief. All right. This is the model. The model stated that a survivor progresses through five emotional stages. And the first one, you all know, is denial. The second one is anger. The third one is bargaining. The fourth one is depression. And then the last one is acceptance. But you know what's interesting? At the very beginning, this whole concept wasn't developed for survivors going through the grieving process. What? They were developed for the people who were terminally ill as a way to come to terms with their own impending death. We used to think it's for those who survived the one that died. No, it was for the ones who were dying. Now, it was only later applied to others who were left in the wake of a loved one's death. Well, we're going to kind of look at this. Uh, what happened to Dathan and Abiram is they saw their own terminal illness. We're going to die here within 40 years. We're stuck. They probably led the group going up the second time. Some people think they're the one. Oh, let's, come on, let's go, let's go. They were motivated by fear. They were motivated by a lack of faith. Look at, uh, yeah, how many of you guys know sometimes fears are irrational? How about a fear of spiders? Anybody like spiders? Or a fear of snakes or a fear of elevators or a fear. And what we have to do is overcome our fears. That's what we have to do. We have to quit looking inward. It's not about us. It's about God, trusting God. That's so hard for people to do. But in Deuteronomy 14, 1 and 2, uh, this is just to, for you to see this. And this is also where Korah was coming from. It says, you're the children of the Lord, your God. You shall not cut yourselves, nor make any baldness. That's the word Korach, right there. The word baldness is Korach. That's his name. Uh, between your eyes for the dead. What this is talking about is self-mutilation. How many of you know in Islam, they have a deal where they do self uh, you know, beat themselves. So many Catholics do it too. You know, they'll go through this. And God is saying, don't do this. Don't mutilate yourself. He says, because you are holy to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his own possession above all the nations of the earth. So he, he says, look, you guys are to be separate. You're to be holy. The whole nation is. This is why Kor says, well, hey, we're, we're all holy. How many of you have ever heard of the uh, Ammonites, the Moabites, the Ammonites? They had the ancient mourning practice of tearing out their hair Okay, uh, and, you know, especially even their eyebrows or right up in here, they would just rip it out, okay? And guess what? Moses was their head, and they're attacking the head. Think of it that way. In Numbers 16, 4 through 7, watch what happens. When Moses heard it, he fell on his face. He spoke to Korah and to his company, and he said this, In the morning, the Lord will show who are his. Who is holy? Who uh, will come? Uh, who he will cause to come near to him? Even him whom he shall choose, he will cause to come near to him. Then he says, okay, guys, do this. Take censers that you want to be priests. Take censers, Korah, and all of his company and put fire in them and put incense on them before the Lord tomorrow. And it'll be that the man whom the Lord chooses, he is the one who'll be holy. Then he says, you've gone too far, you sons of Levi. So they're Levites. 
And look at number 16, 10 through 12. He says, God has brought you near to him. Okay, they were holy, holy. You have the congregation of Israel, then you had the Levites, then you had the priests. And he says, look, he brought you near to him and all your brothers, the sons of Levi with you. And you seek the priesthood also. Then he says, for which cause both you and all your company are gathered against the Lord. And what is Aaron that you murmur against him? And then Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, which said, we won't come up. Moses says, fine, you won't come up. You're going down. Um, look at number 16, 13. Is it, this is Dathan and Abiram speaking. Is it a small thing that you brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey, that means they thought Egypt was a land flowing with milk and honey, to kill us in the wilderness, but now you must also make yourself a prince over us? Okay, they didn't like Moses being the boss. Now, get a load of this. Look at number 16, 13. They're saying, are you making yourself a prince over us? Dathan and Abiram, two brothers, same father. Would well, that ring a bell to you, that saying? Let's go back and look at the Exodus. Moses goes out the second day. Two men of the Hebrews were fighting with each other. It was Dathan and Abiram. These were the two men that were fighting. And Moses said to the one who did the other wrong, why are you striking your fellow? And he said, who made you a prince and a judge over us? These were the same two guys that caused the problem from the very beginning. And Moses was afraid and he says, oh no. Now Reuben was Leah's firstborn. Well, guess what? Now Rachel's firstborn, Joseph, receives the honor. So the Reuben camp isn't real happy. Now, I want you to look at this chart. When you look at this, the Levites surrounded the meeting. Only the sons of Aaron were priests. So the Kohathites, of which Korah was, is right around the tent. Now, Levi had four sons, Amram, Ishar, Hebron, and Uziel. Amram was the father of Moses. Amram's brother, Ishar, was the father of Korah. So Korah and Moses are first cousins. Their dads are uh, their uncle. I wanted to see how close they were to each other. All right. Now, next to the Kohathites is Reuben. And Reuben's two kids were Dathan, Abiram. You have On was the other guy. But so I just wanted you to kind of notice the relationship. This is also why you better be careful who you associate with. Obviously, Korok isn't going to get anyone from these other tribes. They're too far away. He's going to go after the ones who are closest. And of course, Reuben is the firstborn. All right. So you have people who are having problems. Now, <clears throat> the 230. The leaders from the other tribes all ended up dying simply because they were influenced by a bunch of disgruntled, murmuring neighbors. This points to the awesome consequence that the influence of friends, neighbors, and the people you associate with can have on you. Why do we surround ourselves with negative people who are always murmuring about others or those murmuring about leaders within the body of Messiah? You see that. It's always friendly fire that gets everybody. <clears throat> you know, here's the other thing concerning today that you see going on right now. One might have said, well, if God and Moses would just have appeased Korah, if they just would have appeased him and give him an important position, he wouldn't have become angry or rebellious and all this trouble could have been avoided and we could have had peace. Well, <clears throat> Kor was actually rebelling against God. And we see right now people wanting to appease Hamas. If you just appease Hamas, give them a little bit of land, every, you'll have peace. Is that going to work? No. And so this is why we need to learn from history. Appeasing an alligator 
I'll just let you have my hand. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. <clears throat> so number 16, 21 through 27. What does Moses say? Run! <laughs> separate yourselves from this congregation that I... Oh, oh, this is what God is saying. God is saying, separate yourselves among this people that I can consume them in a moment. And what did Moses and Aaron do? They fell on their faces. And they said again, oh God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, will one man sin and will you be angry with all the congregation? I think it's interesting. <clears throat> Moses didn't say anything about the 250 others that rebelled. He focused only on Korah, as if Korah was the only one. The other ones, he says, it wasn't, uh, they were an influenced sinner more than wanting to initiate it. Korah's the one who initiated it. So I think it's fascinating that he says, well, only one man. He didn't even consider the other people of having sinned, that he knew they were just being influenced by their neighbor. So he focuses on Korah. And the Lord says to Moses, tell the congregation, get up from about the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Well, no, wait a minute. How come he didn't say on? I thought on, the son of Peleth was also in that group. How come on's not mentioned this time? Because his wife gave him a good talking to the night before and he repented. That's why he separated himself. Okay. And then Moses rose up. He went to Dathan and Abiram. And the elders of Israel followed him. And he spoke to the whole congregation, said, get out of here. Get away from the tents of these wicked men. Don't touch anything of theirs. And I think that's a very important point. How many of you know so often... If someone is going, uh, let's say somebody dies, and the first thing people do, they go and take what they can out of the house. It becomes their possession. They think, okay, they're dead. Well, here you have people, hey, if they're all going to go, let's grab what's theirs. This was the whole problem in the uh, book of Esther and prior, what had happened, King Saul kept all of the best they said to sacrifice, but God said, destroy it all. But they wanted to keep some of the stuff. All right. Well, then in the book of Esther, a thousand years later, many times it says they did not touch the spoil. So we have to get out of our mind. How much looting goes on? Whenever something happens, a hurricane or something, everyone, the mob, they go in and they try to steal things that aren't theirs. Okay. That I think is going to be a big problem in the future as well. But anyway, he says, get away from the tents of these men. Don't touch anything of theirs, lest you be consumed in their sins. And so everyone got up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram on every side. And now Dathan and Abiram come out, and they stood in the door of their tents with their wives, their sons, and their little children. They are the ones who lost their entire family. Korah didn't. Number 16, 30, 31. Moses says, look, if the Lord makes a new thing and the earth open her mouth, swallow them up with everything that pertains to them and they go down alive into the pit. Who else goes down alive into the pit? The Antichrist and the false prophet in Revelation. Korah is a type of Antichrist. And what does that tell us? Korah is a part of the congregation. And John, John says, the Antichrist come out from among us. This is why we have to understand, I believe the Antichrist could come across as a believer. Now watch. It says, then you'll understand these men have provoked the Lord. It came to pass as he made an end of speaking these words, the ground clave was thunder that was under them. And verse 33 to 35, they and everything that pertained to them went down alive into the pit and the earth closed upon them. And they perished from among the congregation and all that if, uh, were in Israel fled at the cry of them. For they said the Lord or the earth is going to swallow us up. And then what do we see happens? <clears throat> there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 people that offered incense. Just boom. And these were the leaders of the, con these people were famous. Okay. Well, here we go. Let's look at revelations now. Chapter 19 and 20. The beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, in which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and those that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. 
So what do we see? The beast, the false prophet, and Korah's group are the only recorded occurrences of individuals descending into the pit alive. Korah helps us understand the nature and the sin of the Antichrist. Why? He tries to establish his own authority, his own commandments, his own anointing, his own religious practices, and the similarities that exist between Korah's rebellion and the Antichrist's rebellion rebellion or phenomenal. So by studying Korah, we can see how the Antichrist will manipulate people and come to power. Now think about this. The generation prior to the return of Yeshua, okay, which is what we're in right now, uh, I believe will fall away. That, that great falling away that it talks about in the Bible. And they'll get to a point where they cannot discern between the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit versus the power and authority of a self-made ruler. The power and authority of the Holy Spirit, they won't be able to tell the difference between that and the power and authority of a self-made ruler who claims to be following God. Now, here, here's where it gets kind of heavy. What was Korah claiming? He was claiming that God's divine election didn't take place at all. God did not appoint Moses and Aaron. And how many of the church people say God did not appoint Israel? Oh, replacement theology here. Are you getting it, guys? Let that sink in for a minute, okay? They assume Moses and Aaron were self-appointed leaders. How much of Christianity think the Jews were self-appointed leaders? No, they weren't. As a matter of fact, I hear often they wish God had chosen somebody else because of all the troubles they've had. Korah is not only undermining Moses, but he's undermining the entire Torah, saying it's not even God's word. It, you can throw it away. You don't need it anymore. If Moses merely exalted himself in his claim <clears throat> to speak for God... If, listen, if Moses merely exalted himself, then his claim to speak for God is invalid and the Torah becomes a mere human document. If all the people are equally holy, then anyone and everyone can produce a Torah or a book on par with the Torah, and there will be many spiritual paths to choose from. Korah not only challenged the authority of Moses, the authority of the Torah, but also the sovereignty of God, which is what I was telling you about. It's replaced theology. Listen to Psalms 106. This is verse 13 through 18 talking about this. And verse 24 and 25. It says, they hurried and they forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel. They lusted greedily in the wilderness. They tested God in the desert. He gave them what they asked, but he sent leanness to their soul. And they were jealous of Moses in the camp and they're in the saying of the Lord. So the earth opened and swallowed up Dathan, covered the company of Abiram and a fire was kindled in their company. The flame burned up the wicked and they despised the pleasant land. They despised Israel. They did not believe his word, but they murmured in their tents and they did not listen to the voice of the Lord. You know, in the New Testament, where it talks about all these things are written for examples for us, this is the very Torah portion they were talking about. We have to learn from this. This is why this is so important. They didn't listen to the voice of the Lord. Look at number 1641. But on the next day, all the congregation of the children of Israel, look at this, the very next day after Korah died, Dathan and Abiram died for not following the Lord. It says the very next day, they all murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And they say, you killed the Lord's people. And Moses, I mean, I can't cause an earthquake. I can't get the earthquake. But I mean, the people, they're just not getting it. And so look what happens. The Lord spoke to Moses and he says, get out of here. I'm going to consume them all in a moment. And what did Moses and Aaron do again? They fell on their faces. And Moses says to Aaron, take your censer, put fire from off the altar in it, lay incense on it, and run through the congregation to make atonement for them. 
for wrath has gone out from the Lord. The plague has begun. So Aaron did as Moses said. He ran in the midst of the assembly and the plague had already begun among the people. He put on the incense, he made atonement and he stood between the dead and the living and the plague was stayed. And how many died? They that died in the plague were 14,700 people, not counting the 250 in Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Some people just don't learn. And so look what happens now. In number 17, 12, and 13, the children of Israel spoke to Moses saying, we die, we perish, we all perish. Whoever comes anywhere near the tabernacle of the Lord will die. Are we going to be consumed with dying? Now, this is fascinating as we watch this unfold. So what does Moses do? On the morrow, Moses went in the tabernacle. Remember, they took the 12 rods and they said, who's ever rod buds, then we know that's the group that the Lord has chosen, right? Now, if you go walking on a trail, you see a dead stick. What's the chances of that dead stick becoming alive? I mean, not only becoming alive, it buds, it blossoms, and it produces fruit all in one day from a dead stick. So they, after they did that in the morning, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded and brought forth buds and bloom blossoms and yielded almonds. So Moses brought out all the rods from before the Lord to the children of Israel, and they looked and took every man his rod. I wouldn't know if I want my old dead stick back, but... And the Lord said to Moses, this is heavy. Bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony or the ark to be kept for a token against two. The rebels, it says. I want all the rebels to know that Aaron, you know, Moses and Aaron, that rod. And then he says, this is how you're going to take away their murmurings from me that they don't die. Now watch this. In number 1711, and Moses did so. As the Lord commanded him, so did he. Why did they say he did it twice? Why, why couldn't they have just said it once? Why couldn't they, hey, and Moses did so as the Lord commanded him. So did he. Well, here I'm going to talk a minute about power, hungry people versus humble people. Think about this. They're accusing Moses of having too much power. They even said that, but we know they actually were appointed, right? Even unwillingly. So they weren't trying to seize power. But here's the thing. This rebellion was the fourth rebellion. What happened on the first rebellion? The golden calf, okay? And Moses fell on his face. He's pleading, God, don't kill all this people. The second rebellion was when they all wanted quail. We want meat. And what did Moses do? He falls on his face. He intercedes for them. What was the third rebellion? The spies in the wilderness. And Moses is trying to intercede. Well, this was the fourth time, and it becomes personal. They're rebelling. Moses is interceding when they're accusing him of something. Before, the other three times, it's like they were all accusing God, and Moses is falling on his face. Well, now they're accusing him instead. So this fourth one's a little different. It's a little personal. But we still see Moses is more concerned about the relationship with God and God destroying Israel, he's humble. He's not even concerned about himself. His, I mean, he's concerned, but his concern is for the children of Israel not being destroyed. And so he didn't care about his own honor. He only wanted God's or, uh, honor. And it's, they say the reason it is said twice, Moses did so, so did he, it was because Moses didn't want to have this Aaron's rod saying, look, Moses and Aaron are special. That's why God told him once, he hesitated. And so God told him a second time. And so he went ahead. He was that humble. He didn't want to put it up for everyone to see, which is amazing. But here it is. 1 Corinthians 10, 10 and 11, New Testament. Don't murmur as some of them murmured and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, all these things happened unto them for examples. That, this Torah portion was written just for us 
to realize we shouldn't be murmuring. So here we see one group was swallowed up by the earth. Another one was killed by fire. And another group was killed by the plague. And in Numbers 26, 11, this is so important, notwithstanding the children of Korah did not die. Because mom said, we're running, we're getting out of here. Now, what's amazing though, is Korah's descendants managed to break away from the generational curse of jealousy and bitterness. And as a matter of fact, there were 11 Psalms written by the sons of Korah. Isn't that amazing? And then here's Samuel becomes... Uh, he's from Korah, becomes a priest. With that, let's stand. Avinu Mokeno, our Father King, we just thank you so much that we can come and worship you and learn. Father, when we look at the Torah portion and we see the generation that had more miracles than any generation in history was the generation of no faith. They saw miracles, and they didn't have any faith in you. It's amazing that at our day, there'll be all kinds of miracles. And they will believe them, but they'll be by the Antichrist. So, Father, I pray that we would learn from their example. We don't want to repeat their mistakes. So give us all seeing eyes, hearing ears, and a heart that is open to understand why we need to study the Torah so we can learn from the examples of the past. And Father, we want to thank you so much for all those that are here locally, all around the world, the United States, that want to honor you like Moses did. We're not concerned about our own honor. We're not concerned about our own life. We're just concerned about the life and the light of the Torah. We want to magnify the Torah, make it honorable once again. And we thank you for those who sow financially into your ministry to bring your light to the nations. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together. Blessed are you, Lord our God, the creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Okay, today is going to be the final lesson on the 13 attributes of God. And let's start with Matthew 20 and verse 30. There were these two blind men that were sitting by the wayside. And when they heard that Yeshua was passing by, they cried out saying, Lord, have mercy on us, you son of David. Okay, now evidently Yeshua's dad's name was Joseph. So when they say son of David, the blind guys are recognizing that he's the Messiah. The son of David is a messianic term, okay? Now I thought it uh, interesting that the two blind guys recognized him as the Messiah, but all the people who had sight had no clue. But the point is this, he said, have what? Mercy. If you look at these 13 attributes of God, they're all levels of mercy and kindness, which is why I can't imagine why many Christians think that God of the Old Testament was mean uh, and he's uh, actually schizophrenic and now he's nice. Uh, No, he's always been this way. Look at Deuteronomy 32 verse 4. He is the rock. Now, When you understand a lot of Christianity or Catholics in particular think Peter was the rock because Peter uh, was Petros. What's the difference between Petros and Petra? One's masculine, one's feminine. Petros, masculine, means a pebble, a little rock that you would throw. Petra means a massive rock, like the rock of Gibraltar, you can forget about picking up and throwing. And so when you go to Israel and you go to the very place, Caesarea Philippi, where Yeshua made this statement, 
you are looking at a massive rock wall. I've been to many times. Uh, I believe we're going there this next time. You'll be able to see exactly where that happened. And so when you think of a rock like the rock of Gibraltar, it's not going anywhere. And he says his work is perfect. All of his ways are judgment, a God of what? Truth. He's without iniquity, just and right is he. So we see he is full of mercy and truth. Psalm 25, 10. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth, especially those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. Let's look at Psalms 100, verse 5. The Lord is, he's good. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to how many generations? All generations. All right, let's look at Psalm 119, 30. I have chosen the way of truth. Your judgments have I laid before me. And we know Yeshua is the way, the truth, and the life. So now what we're going to look at is the very next Attribute, the eighth attribute is God whose name is abundant in truth. In Hebrew, it is Rav Emet. Rav Emet. Emet is truth. Okay? Now, one of the interesting things, Emet is spelled with the Aleph Mem Tav. You have the Aleph Tav. Okay? And just like you say A to Z, you have Aleph, the Mem is in the middle. And then the tet is at the end. So everything within God is not only truth, but abundant in truth. When you think about truth, you would think it would belong into the category of strict justice. This is the truth. You sinner, you. Okay. So here, when we think of truth, we think it on the side of L, not the side of yud heh vav -Hey. You following me? Okay, not mercy. You wouldn't think truth would belong with mercy. Truth would belong with, this is the truth. These are the facts. You did it. Well, guess what? God's attribute of truth is the connection of the promise again to the fulfillment. For example, the promise of the land to the patriarchs wasn't fulfilled until generations later. So it wasn't, he says to Abraham, you're going to get the promised land, but he never got it. Is that their truth? He didn't get it. All the generations later got it. All right. So this attribute of truth is known when it is fulfilled. The ultimate triumph of goodness is going to take place in the future when the last enemy is put under his feet. There's a lot of promises that we have. Sometimes we wonder how come they're not fulfilled now if you're a God of truth. You know, what, what's go why are there wars? Why are there all these things going on? Well, guess what? It's not just truth here. It's abundant truth. What's the difference between truth and abundant truth? Truth alone will only sentence us to annihilation. <laughs> That's the truth. The wages of sin is death, okay? But abundant truth finds value within the condition of the wicked because truth becomes a part of the process of growth from which good can develop in the future. Now, watch as this unfolds. Here we are with the truth. Now, Look at Daniel 8, 12. And a host was given to the Antichrist against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground. So here you see in the PowerPoint, boom, truth is cast to the ground. Did you see truth cast to the ground there? Is it there? Where is it? I don't see truth. Oh, there it is. Oop, oop. Okay, let's go back. I finally saw it. Here we go. Play. Okay, here we are. What? Let me make sure. 
I'm at the right spot. Oh, nope, I'm at the, that's the next slide. Here we go. Here we are. Okay. Abundant truth, Rav Emet, and watch truth is being cast to the ground. Boom. There's truth. That's what the devil does. The truth is in heaven. Abundant truth. The devil's up in heaven, and he wants to cast the truth down to the earth. But God laughs when he casts truth to the ground because look at Psalm 85, 10, and 11. Mercy and truth. Oh, wow. Mercy and truth are what? They're met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. And then it says truth is going to spring out of the earth. So here, it's been cast to the earth. And then what do we see? Truth comes up from the earth and extends into heaven. So what does that mean? The devil casts truth to the ground. And then from the ground, God takes that truth and brings it back up to heaven. What do we know? The earth has been cursed. So also our human nature, when we've sinned, which is corrupt, but guess what? It's also the fertile field where truth can grow. So God recognizes the value that can grow from a flawed state. The earth is cursed. We have been cursed in our nature. And he values that from our flawed state, he can make truth grow more than he values the state of perfection itself. God created us with the ability to sin. And he wants a person who chooses to be righteous despite the fact that they are not yet righteous. So Rob Emmett introduces the concept that even the condition of evil and guilt can be used for good. Even though we have a sinful nature, truth can end up coming out of it. We become born again and truth comes. God values that more than someone who's never sinned. Isn't that amazing? That's why he wants to show mercy. He wants us, what he, God wants is a person who chooses to be righteous despite the fact that they are not yet righteous. Wow. He introduces the concept that even the condition of evil and guilt can be used for good. Look at Exodus 34, 7. It says, keeping mercy for thousands... Forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin and by no means will clear the guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children to the third and to the fourth generation. But what do we see about this Rob Emmett? Even from a flaw state that we are in, the prayer is, may your truth arise even from our sinful nature. So when we call on God as Rob Emmett, we know you're true, we know we're sinful, but we know a greater good can come out of our sinful nature when we choose you. Isn't that kind of amazing? And so what's next? He keeps mercy for thousands. And you know what that means? That's not a thousand people, that's a thousand generations. So it's for generations, thousands of generations he keeps mercy. And so what that you're going to find out means allow us to continue the course that was begun by Abraham. This attribute extends mercy to our generation. How many of you want to pray for your kids? Want to pray for your grandkids and their grandkids and their grandkids? The repercussions of one good deed can extend beyond the reward to that individual, but also to future generations, as with the promises to Abraham. Okay, what did God promise Abraham? His seed would be like the stars of heaven, right? God committed himself to a covenant not to abandon the Jewish people. And so often the church believes because they sinned, they killed our Jesus or whatever. Actually, it says they turn them over to the Gentiles who killed them, just in case you didn't catch that. But God is not going to break his covenant of mercy to the nation of Israel. As a matter of fact, look at Isaiah 54, verse 10. The mountains will depart, 
the hills will be removed, but my kindness will not depart from you. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, says the Lord who has mercy on you. If we really believe God is a God of mercy for thousands of generations, and you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, okay, you have Israel, the Jewish people. Again, if you believe in replacement theology, you're saying God was impotent and he couldn't save them, or he was a liar. That's your only choices. God lied about this verse, or he couldn't do it. He didn't have the power. This is why we are so opposed to the concept of replacement theology. Look at Jeremiah 31, verse 35 through 37. Thus saith the Lord. Now notice it's not God. What's the difference between God and the Lord? Do you remember? God is Elohim, which means strict justice. yud heh vav is the merciful Elohim. And so notice, whatever you see the Lord, I want you to be thinking mercy. Thus saith the Lord, which gives the sun for light by day, the ordinance of the moon and the stars for light by night. I'm the one who divides the sea, okay, when the waves are roaring. The Lord of armies is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. The last time I looked, the sun, the moon, and the stars are still there. Okay. Thus saith the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundation of the earth searched out, searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, says the Lord. Okay, well, the church says, well, look what they've done. They've killed Lord Jesus. Therefore, he's abandoned them. No, God says, I don't care what they've done. It doesn't matter. I'm not a liar, and I have the power to do what I want to do. So when we recite this name, we should understand and commit ourselves to joining the generational chain. That's part of the chain that is blessed. To sense that we want to continue this course of blessing that was begun by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're not trying to use our connections, but rather to invoke the continuation of their path, not just preserve their values, but advance them. It's just like uh, if you have a kid or a grandkid or great, great grandkid, you want them not just to remember, but we have to be doers. We got to take them to the next generation. When we realize Passover has been kept every single year for two or for 3,500 years, for 35, every generation Passover has been kept. No generation stopped and said, we're not going to do it now. And so when we come to the Passover Seder, we are preserving this promise and continuing it until Messiah comes. That's what's so incredible about all the festivals, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Tabernacles. We're saying, God, continue to give your mercy to thousands of generations, and we want to be a part of that continuation process. Wow. Wow. So keeping mercy for thousands, hey, there's 8 billion people. I hope it's more than 1,000 people. It's referring to generations forever. Now, the 10th, 11th, and 12th are coming together. Forgiving. The Hebrew word forgiving is no set, and it means to lift. And we see he forgives iniquity. He forgives transgression. He forgives sin. Well, we have to understand not all sin is the same as is often said. The Hebrew word for iniquity is avon. For transgression, it's basha. And for sin, it's kata'a. And so we're going to look at these in more detail because I want you to understand when people use the word sin, well, wait a minute. What are you talking about? Did a homeless guy steal a candy bar or did he murder somebody. Those are two different levels of sin. All right, so we're going to look at this. Uh, let's see. I'm going to explain the difference between iniquity, transgression, and sin, and many other Hebrew words. What is going on here, God, in offering his forgiveness, is willing to even turn 
our rebellious and our intentional sins into unintentional sins. What? Someone who is rebellious? Someone who does intentional sins? God in his mercy sometimes will turn them into unintentional sins. Do you remember on the cross? What did the Lord say? Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Wow, right there. Here they're rebellion. They were murdering him. And he says, Father, forgive them. Make it unintentional. They don't even know what they're doing. This is mind blowing. And so we're going to look at this in more detail. Previously, all of the past attributes we've looked at have to do with keeping the sinner alive, <laughs> okay, through God showing mercy. Now we move to the actual sins themselves. The existence of sin in our life is harmful. It's contaminating. It's destructive. Sin is described in the Bible as filth, dirt, stain, mud, <laughs> Even if God consents not to punish us for our sins, guess what? They still damage our souls and the rest of the world. Well, I didn't hurt anybody. Oh, yes, you did. Yes, you did. When you think about it, when someone kills somebody, they're not even thinking about their implications to their spouse, to their kids to their grandkids and how that will affect them because they don't have a dad to grow up with and that what will be the consequence of what they do to someone. And uh, all sin affects others. No matter what, all sin affects others. Look at Luke 23, 34. Here's where Yeshua says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. So here's the thing. God not only forgives, but he bears the crushing weight of our sin. He allows them to be absorbed into his infinite goodness. One of the things is when we sin against God, we have to realize that affects everybody. It affects everybody. Now, I think it's interesting in Mark 2, verse 10, it says that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he says to the guy that's sick, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. What he's saying there is he's divine. I can forgive a sin that you do to me, but I can't forgive a sin that you do to him. Anything that's against me, I can forgive. But how can I forgive uh, two parties who sin against each other? Here, Yeshua is doing that. And they're saying, no one can do that but God himself. And that's why they were so upset. But this again shows you how Yeshua was saying he was divine. Now, look at Jeremiah 17, 14. He says, heal me, O what? Lord, that is yud heh vav -Hey. Heal me and I will be healed. Save me and I shall be saved for you are my praise. Okay, wait a minute. Here are the Jews are saying, save me. And who do they call on? The Lord. Wow, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, that's what they're doing. They're calling upon the name of the Lord. So why would they be saved? It says to the Jewish people, Lord, heal me and I'll be healed. Save me and I'll be saved. Look at Isaiah 43, verse three. For I am the Lord, your God. I am the Holy One of Israel, your what? So who is the Savior? The yud hey vav hey. Look at Isaiah 43, 11. I, even I, am the Lord, yud hey vav hey. And beside me, there's how many saviors? Oh, so the yud hey vav hey is the Savior. And in the Bible, he is called Lord Isaiah 45, 21, tell you and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who has declared this from ancient time? Wow, this is already 2,700 years ago. We're just talking about ancient time back then. Who has told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? There is no God beside me. I am a just God and a what? Savior, and there's no one beside me. 
There's only one Savior, and it is the yud Hey vav Hey, the Lord. Isaiah 49, 26, I will feed them that oppress you with their own flesh, and they shall be drunken with their own blood, as with sweet wine, and look at this, all flesh, that's every human, Jews and Gentiles will know that I, the, what? Lord, yud Hey vav Hey, I am Israel's Savior, the Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Wow, look at Isaiah 60, 16. Israel, you're going to suck the milk of the Gentiles, you'll suck the breast of kings, and you shall know that I, the Lord, am your Savior, Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Matter of fact, look at Hosea 13, 14. Yet I am the Lord, your God from the land of Egypt, and you will know no God but me, for there is how many saviors beside me? Okay, so if you're a Jew, and all of a sudden Christians come and say, there's, a whole, there's another savior over here, and you have all these verses, and you know that you say, Vave, the Lord is your savior, and now they say, oh, there's no, well, guess what? We know Yeshua is the Yudhei Vave. He is the Lord. <clears throat> now, look at this. Titus 1. We're in the Brent Hadashah now. We're in the New Testament, verse 3 and 4. <clears throat> in due times, he has manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me, Paul says, according to the commandment of God, our Savior. To Titus, my own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, peace, from God the Father and from Adonai, Yeshua, Hamashiach, our Savior. This is showing you the triunity of God, and it's showing you that Yeshua is the yud heh vav -Hey. Look at Romans 10, 10 through 13. With the heart, we believe to righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made to salvation, for the scripture says, Whoever believes on him will not be ashamed. There is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. <clears throat> in other words, the Jew and the Greek both call on the yud -Hey They both will be saved. It says, <clears throat> For the same Lord over all is rich unto who? All that call upon him. Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. <clears throat> That's the yud heh vav -Hey. That is the name of the Lord. Now, he has a hundred some names. Just like these 13 attributes, they all come from the yud heh vav -Hey. yud heh vav -Hey means mercy. That's why we're reading mercy and, you know, chesed, rakamim, okay, chanan. And Yeshua is Savior. And the yud heh vav -Hey is our Savior. And Yeshua is is the yud heh vav -Hey, and he is the Lord. Okay, so let me see. Let me look at this next one. I think it's interesting that the Lord here in this picture, he bore all of our burdens, all of our iniquities. He took them all. The Lord himself became flesh. Wow, there's something that Danny and I have been working on the other day, and it's mind-blowing. It is so mind-blowing. And this is reminding me, I could have added it to this, but I'll just discuss it maybe next week. Um, yeah, I mean, it is, uh, we're making this, this Bible, an electronic Bible, where we're correcting all the errors. Oh, my goodness. <clears throat> I'll have to talk about that next week. Let's see what I got. So basically, with this, these attributes, we're saying God neutralized the harmful impact of our willful sins by transforming them into unintentional sins. But let's take a minute and let's look at the different words for sin. Okay, I have it up on the screen, half of them. This is why you have to understand when you're reading a word, what does it really mean? Kata or kata'a means to miss the mark. The word iniquity or avon is like a misdemeanor. 
Then you have a transgression, which is uh, pesha, which is a premeditated crime. Then you have being unfaithful. The Hebrew word is ma'al, and it means an embezzler, someone who is a, like an embezzler in trust. Then you have the word unrighteous, which is avel, which means to discriminate or doing an injustice. And then we have the word perverseness, which is amal, and it means to be perverse. We have the word mara, which means to rebel or be stubbornly disobedient. We have the word wicked, which is rasha, which is with strong excitement, you just love evil. And then there's vanity or aven, which means to live worthlessly. Finally, evil, which is raw, which is great wickedness. And so when you read in Genesis chapter 6 that uh, God was so upset because the hearts of men were only evil continuously, that is full of great wickedness. It's not just a little mistake. It's not just a premeditated crime. It's someone who wants to destroy everything God has created. That's their whole point. That's their life. And so we have to see, uh, think of a target, and I'm shooting an arrow at it. The very first level means I missed the target. Okay? But at least I'm aiming at the target. But then what happens, then I start crossing a line. And then I get worse and worse and worse until finally raw means I'm not even aiming at the target. I'm shooting a whole different direction. That's why when we truly repent, it's we're going all the way back to now we're shooting at the target. That's what true repentance is. is it, you following me? So that, that is where we need to be. Now, I'll give you an example of some of these. The word in Leviticus 5, 15, it says, if a soul commit a trespass. Okay, well, a trespass is you betray trust, all right? And then in, Levi in then the next step of Avel, which means injustice, uh, it also is translated as unrighteous in Leviticus 19, 15. It says, you shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. In other words, don't discriminate between the rich and the poor. Don't do an injustice or be unrighteous in how you evaluate things. Uh, that word, the sixth one, a mall uh, from Numbers 23, 21, where it says, he has not beheld iniquity, that's aven, in Jacob, neither has he seen perverseness in Israel. And then this last one I just told you about raw, and I thought this was fascinating when I looked at it. In Genesis 6, 5, it really is, God saw the great wickedness, just this wickedness, but the great wickedness of man was great in the earth, Every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only, what? Evil. Great wickedness. It's not just in their actions, but was in their heart. Everyone's thoughts were to commit great wickedness, great evil. And so this brings us this 13th commandment or attribute of God is by no means clearing the guilty. That is venake lo yena. Okay, what in the world is that talking about? That means he cleanses, all right? But look at this. When we haven't repented, we still must realize, even after we repented, we're only existing by God's mercy alone. God's mercy is what keeps the wicked people alive. The attributes of God's mercy is what keeps the world turning. Now, this is one of the most heaviest statements that really hit me. I mean, this is really heavy. Let's say it's slow. How many of you think to get mercy, you have to repent first? Well, okay, let's look at this. Repentance is not 
a prerequisite for divine mercy. It's the goodness of God that leads me to repentance. Repentance is the goal of divine mercy. Isn't that amazing? You don't, God doesn't say, you have to repent before I will give you mercy. God says, I'm going to shower upon you so much love and mercy so that you will repent. Think about it. This is, what is, this is why in the Hebrew it says, basically, um, if you stomp on the blood of the Messiah, there's no chance for repentance. Why? Because that's all he can do. What more can he give than his son? What more can Yeshua give than his entire life? What he, if you rebel against that and you don't repent when you see how much love and mercy he's shown you, what else does he have? The wicked receive God's mercy every second of their life by him allowing them to breathe. Think about it. God is merciful, gracious to the absolutely most wicked, evil person. He shows them mercy, hoping that they would not stomp on his mercy and grace and see it. I have a license to sin. How many of the church say, God's mercy gives me a license to sin. I can sin all I want now. I got my get out of hell free card. That gives me permission to sin all I want. No, 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 no. God is showing Christians mercy and love and they think he's giving it to me while I'm wicked. That must be proof that all my sins are paid for. The horror of this, the horror of this. I don't know if it's really grasped to people the way it grasped me. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm just existing by the mercy of God. God continues to show me grace and mercy because he wants me to repent, not to continue in my sin and give me a license to sin all I want. I, I hope that this is sinking in. Okay. <clears throat> so in other words, with this divine name, we're saying, God, draw close and cleanse us. I repent. Draw close and cleanse us. Romans 2, 4. Do you despise the riches of his goodness and his forbearance and his long suffering, not knowing that the goodness and mercy of God is what leads you to repentance? Nope, I just think that gives me a license to continue in my sin. Look at Exodus 32, 34 through 35. Go and lead these people into the place of which I've spoken to you. Behold, my angel will go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. God is forbearing, he's long-suffering, but the consequence of our sin will come. The hope is that by the time that the punishment is ready to service, surface, the individual will have already repented. So God is saying, look, they're... You know, I'll not let the horrible consequences happen right now, but the time is coming they're going to be punished. The hope is if they repent beforehand, they don't have to be punished. One sage interpreted this verse as he cleanses those who do repent, and he doesn't cleanse those who do not repent. Repentance affects the definition of what it means to exist. Malachi 3.7 even from the days of your fathers, you are gone away from my ordinances and you have not kept them. And then he says, return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, the 13th attribute is based upon closeness. We feel a yearning that we can find no rest, the feeling that without God's closeness, there can be no life at all. Which is why in Psalms 42, verse 1 and 2 just as the heart pants after the water brook, so panteth my soul after you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? How many of us want to appear before God? We better make sure we're clean. Life with sin feels like we're strangling, and so we make a covenant with this name of God. This attribute declares that God will draw close and cleanse us as we draw close to him. Amen? So with that said, and everything you've learned over the last three weeks, let's stand.